Hello, my name is Bobby Hilster and I am your Particle Model Guru. Today I'm going to talk about three anomalies and how these three anomalies help me come to the conclusion that the G1 replaces the graviton and the photon. Science uses the word anomaly to indicate that the event that is unusual probably won't happen again and therefore can be ignored. It, it almost seems like it can be used as an excuse. Yeah, okay, yeah, we see it, it's interesting, it's funny, it's, uh, but since I can't explain it, then very possibly I may I, I can just ignore it and, and don't worry about it. Well, I'm, I'm not of that uh, idea at all, although there are probably more than three anomalies. The ones listed below, below were of great importance to me. There was the Lay anomaly of 1954, uh, and again, uh, he had another anomaly in 1959, and there's the Wang eclipse in 1997. So we'll take a look at these. This is in 1994. Maurice Lay was uh, working with a pendulum and watching the movement of a pendulum during uh, an eclipse. And you can see the eclipse is marked on this screen. Here's the start of the eclipse, and this is <coughs> when the, mix, the eclipse was at its total. And then here is the end of the eclipse. The straight line indicates how you would expect the pendulum to move as as, uh, as the Earth uh, moves counterclockwise, then the pendulum appears to move clockwise. So it starts out here at 178 degrees and moves down to about 173, and then, for some reason, it jumps backward, literally and almost instantaneously jumps backwards, as time goes on, it moves backwards more and more and, and wiggles around, never smooth, and then s sweeps down and sweeps down and wiggles around a little more and more, finally coming back to the, the point where it should have been in the first place. It's almost like the pendulum found its way back as if the, the eclipse had never even happened. People get all excited. They look at this and they say, how can that happen? I don't understand it. And they can't duplicate it easily anyway. And so they call it an anomaly. In 1959, uh, he, he did, uh, was doing it again. The pendulum should move this direction from 195 in the straight line. But at the start of the uh, eclipse, at the point of maximum uh, eclipse and at the end is marked and again it jumps backwards it does a totally different path uh, not similar at all but nonetheless there it is it's hard to explain and they call it an anomaly it's the LA anomalies the Wang eclipse. Qian Shen Wang, with others, measured the gravitational effect of a full eclipse on March 9th in 1997 in China. He used a gravimeter, measures the vertical gravitational acceleration at a point where it's placed. Wang took the measurements, subtracted the average value, and plotted the difference. He also put three points identifying the visual eclipse, just like uh, Maurice did. And he ends up with two anomalous bumps. What you what 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 happens is he, these these dots are all the measurements. So he has a statistical average of all the measurements, but he took the average over several days and subtracted it from the literal measurement and plotted the difference and got this, got this and this, and he got these two bumps. 
you mark the first contact. He calls it instead of the start. It's the first contact. Here's totality. And right here is the final contact. What's interesting is that most of this bump occurs before the eclipse. And a, a lot, most of this bump occurs after the eclipse. And the third thing that they don't like is uh, not only do they don't like the bumps, but they don't like the fact that there's almost no decrease during the total eclipse. You certainly would expect a different gravitational measurement during the eclipse. Two bumps, two anomalies, uh, two bumps there. Okay, there is a, uh, a book by, edited by Hector Munera. This is a book. Uh, Hector attended our conferences at some point. That's kind of hard to see his face there. There are a lot of different authors in this book talking about the work of Maurice Allais, but it also includes the Wang eclipse in it. So it's all about Maurice Allais and eclipses. It's an interesting book. Maurice uh, gave, to, gave, gave that book to my son David and asked him to give it to me because he knew at, some, at that point back then that I was interested in studying these anomalies. By the way, one of the reasons you find in this book that they, they, they try to duplicate a lot of these things and they never can exactly duplicate uh, Maurice's work or Wang's work uh, and that's because no two eclipses are exactly alike. There's just so many different variables involved in the eclipse that to get two of them as, uh, the, to be the same is, is quite remarkable. Well, it was December 2008. I woke up in the middle of the night and was thinking about these anomalies. And I, I was laying there thinking about it. I said, no, wait, wait. There's more to these charts than bumps and the weird moving pendulums. It's the timeline that's of interest to me. The timeline indicates that the gravitational effects of the eclipse appears on the surface of the Earth about the same time as the visual effect. This was my first clue that the speed of gravity was about the same as the speed of light. Just a clue. Doesn't prove it try to calculate it, you probably wouldn't get very good answers, but it appears that it could be the same as the speed of light. Scientists say the speed of light is that it's three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So well known, nobody really disputes this uh, value. That's the speed of light in a vacuum. My question is what what is your opinion about the speed of gravity? And I didn't say what is gravity there, but that's what I meant to ask. What is the speed of gravity? They say the speed of light is that. What's the speed of gravity? Okay, so let's help you decide the question. You go out and stand on the uh, a surface of the earth and it's high noon, the sun is straight overhead and I'm going to ask you the question, where is the sun? So think about it. Well, when you were young, you're, you may have asked the, what, your question of your parents, so what's that yellow thing up in the sky? And they're going to say, well, that's the sun. Science teacher may even said uh, go through certain things and say, okay, now we're going to assume the sun is up here. In a very common language, all the time we say the same thing, the sun is straight overhead at high noon, or at least directly south and overhead. That's where we say the sun is. Okay. One of the interesting results of that assumption is that you're actually assuming that the speed of light is instantaneous. Let me talk you, let me just make a simple statement. If the sun is really here 
And if you have the image of the sun in your eye at the same time, so at time zero, the sun appears here. At time zero, the image is in your eye. The only way that can happen is if the speed of light is instantaneous. And it turns out that a lot of people had that opinion. I think it was um, Johannes Kepler that I read about who said he thought the speed of light was instantaneous. And probably for the same reason. I didn't read a reason, but to me, this is very clear. If you assume the sun is there, and the image of it in your, is in your eye. The only way that can happen is if as soon as the light's emitted, it's there. It's instantaneous. So you, by assuming that that's where the sun is, you inadvertently assume that the speed of light is instantation, instantaneous, but then you don't believe it. You're making the assumption you don't know it. You may not even think about it. And if somebody told you the speed of light was instantaneous, you tell them, no, I don't believe you. Many have assumed that the speed of gravity is, quote, instantaneous action at a distance. There are some scientists today that will say that. Yeah, uh, that's my model, instantaneous action at a distance. But most really don't believe that gravity acts instantaneously any more than they believe light acts instantaneously. Even with these assumptions, Newton's equation works. Here's why I say that. If you were Tycho Brahe, who was, uh, and Kepler helped him get all this data, and he's looking through a telescope at a, a, a planet, and he sees the planet, he marks the location, and then a, a, a few days later, he looks at that same planet look, uh, and, and uh, marks its distance by where he sees it. And then he plots uh, the distance between them and the time between them. He can estimate the speed of the planet. He can do all kinds of things. And, and, and in essence, can predict using Newton's equation where it's going to go next. So even with these two assumptions, that the light is instantaneous, instantaneous and the speed of gravity is instantaneous, Newton's equation works. So if the speed of both is instantaneous, then you are saying that the speed is the same. It's just another way of saying the same thing. They're the same. Well, let's take a little bit of closer a look at it. I asked you earlier, where is the sun? Uh, that was a little bit of a leading question uh, because uh, I was thinking that there is a visible sun and there is a physical sun and they're not necessarily in the same place, especially as viewed from the surface of the Earth. You can view this phenomenon from a different place. It'll look different, harder to come to the same conclusion, but, but it's possible. So let's take a look at this dark circle. It represents the physical sun, and you can't see it. Why? If it has just arrived here, the light from that sun has just started to be emitted and come down. So you, it's over here and you can't see it. Well, let's assume at, uh, 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 that 500 seconds ago, it was over here. It was over here. And when it arrived at this point, it emits light. And 500 seconds, that's how long, approximately 500 seconds, that's how long it takes the light to go 93 million light, miles from the sun to the earth. Okay. <laughs> now, at the same time, it emits light. Now, now, keep in mind, we're talking about the physical sun here. Then... Uh, it emits light. At the same time it emits light, there are G1 particles coming at this point from all directions, including through the sun. There's particles coming through the sun towards this point. 
At the same time the light is emitted, some of the particles have passed through the sun and they will be scattered or trapped, causing a reduction in the number of particles. So along with the image of light as it moves down towards Earth, you have a reduction of light above where I'm pointing, and no reduction, not a reduction of light, a reduction of the G1 particle above the line, and no reduction of the G1 particle below the line. Okay, light's emitted, particles are reduced, they, they move together all the way down to this point and after 500 seconds you see it because the visual image has arrived and lo and behold the tides are there. That's what the anomalies show that the, that the gravitational effect arrives on the surface of the earth at or about the same time as the visual image. So when, you, when the image is here in your eye, we see the ocean tides or the continental tides. While this light is moving this way, the sun is moving in this direction. Not because the sun is moving, but because the earth is moving east, it appears to us that the sun is moving west. So by the time of the image is here, there's nothing up here. There's nothing there to see because the sun physically is over here approximately two degrees to the west. So next time somebody asks you the question, where is the sun? You can say, well, that's an image of the sun up there, but the physical sun is there. Now that only as viewed from the surface of the earth. So maybe the speed of gravity and the speed of light are, say, both instantaneous. And, and uh, every astronomer uh, makes that assumption and uses it and uses Newton's equation, and, and it works. Maybe the speed of gravity and the speed of light are both half C. Maybe the speed of gravity and the speed of light are actually C, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. No matter which one of these three is true, if the speed of light is the same, I, I conclude that the, that the Newton's equation works. And out of the three choices, obviously, I choose C. As confirmation of that, uh, in 2012, there was a report released by a group of Chinese. There's the link to it. This is the abstract. And the, I'll read portions of this. We have found that the current practical Newtonian formula for the gravity for gravity tide of the Earth implies the hypothesis that gravity travels at the speed of light. Uh, you can go to this link and read the report in detail. You'll find they did a, a, a very credible job. This is their conclusion, specifically. They found the speeds of gravity are from 0.93 to 1.05 times the speed of light with a relative error of about 5%. So we're going to talk about the G1 particle. The graviton is the particle that people talk about. If, if gravity is caused by a particle, they call it the graviton. The source of the graviton has to uh, it has to be all around us because we we claim that it's coming at us from all directions. I said in one of the videos that uh, someone has estimated that there are seventy sextillion stars in the observable universe, and these stars emit gravitons, and they are coming at us from all directions. So they come from the stars. The photon comes from the stars. They both come from the same place. They both propagate through space at or about the speed of C. Maybe they're the same particle. Maybe. That's when I concluded, and Dave concluded, that the G1 particle replaces the graviton and the photon because they come from the same place and they have the same speed. Back to the anomalies. 
there are no anomalies in nature. Nature doesn't make mistakes. Nature does what nature does. There are only discrepancies between measurements and calculations or between measurements and our ideas of what's supposed to happen. Just, it's, nature doesn't make mistakes. It works the way it's supposed to. I will discuss the three anomalies in more detail in future videos. If you like the videos, click on the subscribe button below and you will get an email for the release of any new video. Okay, my name is Bob D. Hilster and I am your Particle Model Guru. Tune in next time when I'll explain more of the universe using the Particle Model. Thank you for your attention.